And so what we game designers have the most control over is the mechanics, is the systems. And so I think that what you start asking yourself is, what systems do I want to have in my game in order to achieve the end I'm trying to achieve? This week on Backward Compatible, Jim, Doc, and Chris talk about the methods tabletop RPGs use to evoke a specific emotion or experience for their players. Plus, Yakuza Zero, Battle Chef Brigade, Harry Potter Wizards Unite, and more. Backwardcompatible.com podcast starts right now. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode 117 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast. Games and new media with a splash of academia. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Jim. Hey, everybody. And we're joined by Doc. Hello. And our media topic discussion today should be a pretty fun one. I found a really awesome tweet recently um, from Sydney Icarus at Action Economy on Twitter, uh, where he says, listening to role-playing game designers describe their process is like that how to draw an owl thing. Uh, find an emotion you want to hit, then around that, just design an award-winning RPG. Uh, and for those of you who haven't seen this, the one he's referring to is this image that uh, is a little bit of a meme, where it's how oh, to, it's a lot bit of a meme. <laughs> how to draw an owl in two steps: one, draw some circles; two, draw the rest of the f-ing owl. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Um, so it just goes from like having like two guide circles to just fully fleshed out, beautifully rendered feathers and everything yeah. owl. Uh, that's that's how you draw an owl. Uh, so what we're going to talk about today actually is specifically with tabletop role-playing games because uh, we've had a lot of experience playing them doc and i designed them um we do yes we do oh, wow. believe it or not see also the doc and kruger cast coming out very soon mm. oh great now we have to record those <laughs> um, and i've designed one too yeah jim has designed one as well but sort of very very simplistic <laughs> that's simplistic is fine is it as simple as doc's simple rpg no 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 i'll talk a little bit about it in the media actually oh, okay. if we want to um it's more of a know your audience <laughs> But we are going to talk a little bit about how you create a specific experience um, through the choices you make in the design and the mechanics and stuff like that. How is it that you achieve this sort of thing beyond just uh, uh, draw draw an owl? Mm-hmm. So and, um, and who who are you, who are you aiming the game at? Because that's going to influence that your design big time. Absolutely. Uh, so it should be a really fun topic. But first, we have some opening segments for you, including the button mosh. <laughs> For the button mosh, where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately. Well, I've been playing lately um, a really fun game in a series that I just discovered this year. I've been playing Yakuza Zero. And to give a little bit of a background, uh, the Yakuza series of games have, have been going on since the PlayStation 2 era. Um, and they're kind of these, they're these open world games where you play a um, either you know a Japanese gangster slash Yakuza or you know, an ex-Yakuza, depending on your perspective in the storyline of that particular game. Um, and it's kind of this mixture of this very serious and dark crime drama with weird and wacky what they call sub-stories in the game and just really weird experiences. It's a very interesting series. And the one I played recently um, is Yakuza Zero. And it actually came out in... Uh, 2015, early 2015, for the PS3 and the PS4 in Japan, but it didn't actually come to America until early this year, early 2017. And um, it's it's a prequel to the Yakuza series, which I hadn't played until recently when I played Yakuza Kiwami, which was the remake of the first Yakuza game. So um, it's kind of interesting because I'm taking a step back and I'm taking a step forward in a way, but also kind of back. Um, in this game, you play as both um, Kiru Kazuma, Kazuma, which is the, the main character of the Yakuza series, but you also play, you switch chapters. Every two chapters, you switch, um, and the other character you play as is the, the frequent um, villain slash antihero of, of this, the Yakuza series, um, Goro Majima. And he's that really strange character that I talked about in uh, Yakuza Kiwami, where he just sort of pops up and wants to fight you at, at all these different moments and has these weird ways to get you to get you to fight him. Like he dresses up as a hostess at a hostess club and gets, makes you go on a date with him before before he will fight you. I was imagining Twinkies. Yeah, just weird, weird situation. So, um, but in this game, he has a different sort of character because it's him twenty years ago, 
it's probably the best where 15 years ago it takes place in 1988 so this is a prequel it's a prequel to the entire series does it have a lot of 80s elements in it, it has a lot of 80s elements really? but 80s japan Okay. It's really interesting. Um, so you're in 1988 Japan in a, in a specific part of, of Japan, and it's kind of like the red light district slash Las Vegas of Tokyo. It is a fictionalized recreation of uh, Kabukicho. And then there's also some of Osaka's uh, Dotanbori as well as, an, as another city that you're in, but it's mostly the, the, the former. And you can tell, I mean, it's, a, it's bright lights, lots of neon, um, very 80s inspired. There's an 80s uh, arcade that you can go to. You are in 80, so I guess it's just an arcade um, where you play some Sega games because it is a Sega game itself. So you get to play Outrun and um, Space Harrier, some 80s classics at the arcade. Um, uh, kind of what I wanted to talk about, though, with this particular experience is how the game kind of balances these two playing as two different characters because both of the characters have different fighting styles that you can switch between, just like Yakuza Kiwami. Only now there's another character that also has different fighting styles, and they they fight slightly differently. There's different special moves and different finishers and the way you have to approach fights for each one. So it's almost like you're learning six different characters, Hmm. in a sense. You know, six different fighting styles, because you have three fighting styles for one character, and I'm going to unlock a fourth one pretty soon for, for, for Kiru, and then three different fighting styles for Majima. So it's just this weird experience where, in the middle of a battle, you'll switch fighting styles because, situationally, it makes sense to do so. But you have to kind of retain all that information, and the game does actually a really good job of making the fighting styles function closely enough together that you can do that without completely breaking breaking you as a gamer and you're like i don't know what to do this is just too different because i've been so focused on this one style because when you switch between chapters um from you know kiru to majima they'll do or, or vice versa they'll even do a, a short interlude where it's hey previously in this person's story and they'll kind of catch you up again because um the the storyline itself is even more um rich than Yakuza Kiwami's was in terms of just the depth and the complexity of the of the, the crime drama part of it. It's can actually be a little tough to follow at times if you're not really paying attention during the cutscenes. So, um, and I'm a fan of of, of Asian cinema. So, um, and I, I don't mean just you know Hong Kong action movies, which I do like, but also uh, crime dramas and, and you know Yakuza films. And um, it's it's very interesting how they have this. They're managed. They manage to strike these. Two very, you know, disparate tones at the same time. Where I mean, not at the same time, but in the same game, I should say. Where on the one hand you have this, you know, really, really rich, complex, um, and very serious and dark storyline mixed with um, literally a guy wearing nothing but his briefs, running through the street, runs up to you and starts dancing provocatively in front of you, talking about meeting pretty women. I mean, and he just talks about like, hey, where, where do you meet pretty girls? I know some good places. And you're just, you're, you're literally both you as the gamer and the character um, both have the same reaction. Like, what, who the hell are you and why <laughs> should I talk to you? It's just this weird experience. And, and I guess that's one of the things that makes the game kind of work and might also be why they changed Majima's character a little bit to be a little, clo- a little more serious because, and they did this in Kiwami as well, the weird experiences that you have, you're like the straight man. That's your role. So you have all these weird, crazy experiences, but you you take it completely straight. You're not you're not part of of the joke. You're not in on the joke. The jokes happen, and your serious reaction to them is part of what makes it funny. Mm-hmm. And so that is definitely like they're very self aware about what they're doing. Anyway, not to get too far into it, I do want to say there's tons of mini games, tons of things to do. It's got a so it's got a lot of content, and it it released for a full sixty dollars. Unlike Yakuza Kiwami, that was only a $30 game because it had not as much content. But if you can pick up either of these games, definitely do it. I was able to get a Black Friday special for Yakuza 0 and paid only about 20 bucks. Nice. And I'm really glad that I did. Um, anyone else looking for that kind of experience, um, please pick it up. If you're interested in Japan, if you're interested in supporting some of these stranger games that sometimes get localized and sometimes don't, um, give it a try. So speaking of uh, potentially weird games, uh, but I think that actually they uh, pulled this off really well, Battle Chef Brigade. Um, anyone who's a fan of uh, Iron Chef, um, the TV series, would probably get into this, uh, at least in concept. The idea is that basically it's that. It's a cooking competition where you've got these chefs who are kind of put under a time limit or some other um, sort of 
uh, circum or some other restrictions that make things uh, difficult and have to, um, within, within that time limit, create these gourmet dishes to present to judges, uh, who then kind of pick a winner between the two, whoever, uh, performed the best. And on Iron Chef and in this game, there's always this theme ingredient that you have to incorporate into each dish in order to, um, uh, get the most points possible. Metal Chef Brigade puts kind of this fantasy spin on it, which is kind of interesting. It's an original fantasy world. And the idea is that uh, monsters exist in this world, and society is always kind of feared monsters. Uh, but then we figured out that we can hunt them and cook them. <laughs> um, Aww, and, dude. And Delicious. And so uh, basically there's this brigade. It's like kind of this quasi-military <laughs> thing where they protect people from monsters and also serve them up in delicious dishes. Um, so, you know, Paleolithic man had the same realization. <laughs> yeah, I suppose that's true. <laughs> yeah, just saying. Um, it's this really interesting blend. It's uh, First of all, aesthetically it's really neat. It's actually all hand-drawn. Um, so you'll find that some of the animations are um, – uh, very low frame rate, uh, but it's kind of in a functional way. It's a lot like kind of old school 2D um, brawlers where uh, you do a thing and it's expected that you have like an immediate sort of hit on it. Uh, and so the animation is actually very um, good, uh, very stylized, but it's also kind of like low frames, which is interesting to me. Um, but the flow of the game is basically when you start a battle, they announce um, – who the judges are and each judge has a preference for a different taste profile they like. So um, what they do to kind of keep things a little bit simpler, a little bit more accessible is rather than saying um, you need to know how to cook and how to mix these flavors, they'll give you elements for each monster and each monster has kind of like these component parts, if you will, that are different elements, fire, earth, and water. And a judge will say, I want a fire based dish or I mm. want a water based dish. Or sometimes they'll say, I want um, a mix of earth and fire. And when you do that, uh, basically the dash of wind, please no. <laughs> <laughs> the most prominent ingredient, uh, the highest quality ingredients have to be that element. Or if it's a balanced dish, it actually has to have, um, equal parts of those two elements, it, which is really interesting. I'm also, I'm picturing that you're hunting Pokemon since you're mentioning the elements. I was thinking the same thing. So I'm just going to go with that in my head. <laughs> well, I was just about to get to that. So what they do is they announce that, they announce the judges, they announce the theme ingredient, which is sometimes a, a fruit or a vegetable. You. Uh, sometimes it's a specific <laughs> <choose> monster. You. <laughs> you're delicious. <laughs> and then when they start the match, you've got this time limit and you have to basically run out of the kitchen and into kind of like you go through this almost like magical gate of sorts where you're in this uh, wilderness environment of some sort where you have to hunt monsters. Uh, and so this is kind of like where you get the action part of the game where you run around with your kitchen knives and basically chop up monsters and stuff like that. So um, they have everything from like dragons to these sort of like fox like creatures. They have these like kind of like flying so, piranha plants. So this sounds to me like it is inspired by two things. One, Monster Hunter, obviously. Um, and the other, have you heard of the Toriko anime? Toriko? I, I've not. It is about a he calls himself a gourmet hunter mm. where he goes around and he travels with his companion who is a really good cook. And he basically, um, finds and, and slays large beasts so that his friend can cook them into exciting dishes. <laughs> so <laughs> kind of, kind of similar to uh, both of those, yeah. but, uh, sounds, sounds interesting. Yeah. The game is developed by trinket studios. Okay. Um, and once you have hunted the monsters and you get their ingredient parts, um, and you know, there's kind of you, their ingredient. Oh, that sounds so gross. Well, so like, what will happen is you like take ingredient out parts. You take out, say, for example, um, like this uh, this one creature. You might be able to harvest uh, like its its ribs, um, and then also its stomach, and then also like sometimes they have things like bladders and livers and other stuff. It kind of depends on the creature. Mm -hmm. um, and then bladders, you, delicious. and then you run back with all these ingredients to the kitchen, and then it be, kind of becomes a little bit of a puzzle game. Um, a little bit of reminiscent of Poyo Pop and other sort of like match color sorts of stuff um, where you drop in the ingredients and each ingredient has a very specific sort of um, it's got like two reds and two blues or something like that or like a blue and a green or all greens or whatever the case might be. Um, each of those colors being a different element. And you have to match a certain number of them in order to upgrade that ingredient to a better quality thing. Uh, and what this ends up translating into is that uh, the higher quality ingredients you have, the higher the score of the dish. Uh, but they factor in other things like, for example, did you use that theme ingredient somewhere in the dish? Mm. Um, they also start to um, add this challenge later where you have these uh, poisonous ingredients that you have to 
make sure aren't in the dish before you serve it or else you get deducted points. <laughs> um, deducted points as opposed to a, <laughs> one of the judges dying. Yeah, well. <laughs> you accidentally um, served me poison. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm accidentally going to die. I'm going to dock a point from you. Uh, and it's actually, it, it seems very simple at first, but it's actually surprisingly deep. And they have this great stuff where you can actually customize your loadout throughout the story. You get uh, new equipment and different stuff like that, where you can change your combat style a little bit. You can get... Um, Different things that like maybe um, ovens, for example, that you can stick a dish in there while you're working on something else that will upgrade gems over time. Um, you can have uh, different pans, like for example, that um, special, they can only match one type of element, but it only takes two instead of three. So you can get higher quality ingredients with less. Um, there's this one you get very late in the game where it's actually um, you match four level one gems to get them leveled up to the maximum of three um, without having to go through that intermediate second stage. Um, so actually, like, really cool, deep mechanics of the game throughout the campaign does this great job of teaching you over time. They sort of slowly ease you into different concepts um, to the point where uh, by the end of the game, you're really amazing at it and you have all this complexity and you have this great knowledge of stuff that you've just kind of built up over time. Uh, so there's a great set of, sense of progression there. Um, the story is pretty nice. Um, it's straightforward, but it's, it's well executed. Um, the game is only $20. Uh, I thought the campaign was... Not incredibly long, but definitely long enough to feel satisfying. Um, so it doesn't feel like you're getting gypped on that in any way. I would say that my one um, kind of request for an update, if I could make one, would be I really want to see a, a local multiplayer where you and another player can go off and like you have this time limit. You're each hunting and you're each cooking and you go up against each other. What a cool idea. Uh, right now, it's either it's pretty much a single player or there's a mode they have called a uh, daily cook off where it's kind of like. Uh, a specific sort of themed battle. It's you as this character versus this other character, and mm. there's specific loadouts. And it's kind of like an online leaderboard thing where you try to get the highest score of anyone. But I had a blast with this game. I thought it was a great mix of that action and puzzler. Um, thematically, it just kind of spoke to me because I'm a fan of Iron Chef and shows like that. Yeah. The game actually does a great job of kind of giving you that sense of like, oh crap, it's coming down to the wire. I need to finish this dish and get it on the you know, get it on the plate before the time's up. Um, so it really kind of puts you in that place. Nice. I, I highly, highly recommend this game. Um, it, for $20, it's a steal. Go get it. It's called Pokemon Battle Chef? <laughs> Battle Chef Brigade. Oh, okay. It's time for War Stories. Tales of Tribulation and Triumph in Gaming. recently went down for uh, Thanksgiving to Houston, or Houston area, I should say, the Woodlands, and um, went to an arcade that's opened up that's been there for a, almost a year at this point. Uh, it's called the Games Preserve, and um, it is very different from the some of the arcades that we have around here in Dallas, uh, specifically Free Play. Free Play's awesome. Um, it's it's. I have some issues with free play. Do you know? Yeah, um, a, a few of them. One of them is that they have, it's really focusing more on the bar and food element than the games, in my opinion. Really? That's where they make a lot of their money. Um, and uh, the, I think they keep their games in great conditions. How recently have you been? Um, it's been a few months. Because, well, I've been well, a couple of months ago, and since they opened, a lot of their machines are either broken or the joysticks and buttons are not working Oh, that's right. unfortunate. So uh, I, I will say that that's one of the complaint that I have. The other, though, is honestly, it's too bright. It's too open. It mm. doesn't feel as much like an arcade. Um, what I like about the Games Preserve is it's not just one big space like free play. Mm -hmm. It's multiple rooms. So there's smaller rooms. Some, there are definitely some bigger spaces, but there's, it's not as brightly lit. It's a lot darker. Mm -hmm. Even though they've, they've presented it more as a family establishment, in fact, they don't sell drinks. Oh. No. So it's more of a You mean alcohol? I mean anything at right now. No they don't have a license. Yeah, but you can actually bring in your own beverages. Oh, okay. Um, I like their layout. They have a lot more pinball machines, but I think they do a better job oh, of, in terms great. of maintenance. Um, there are various racing games and um, games with spinners, like the big track balls. Sure, yeah. Things like the original Marble Madness or um, Centipede and Millipede. Mm -hmm. These are games that if that if that spinner is not well maintained. You cannot play the game. That's true, yeah. So it's I was pretty. I thought it was pretty, uh, pretty well maintained from what I experienced. But one of the things I wanted to, to talk about was I went with um, my nephew and uh, my sister, his mother, and he's only six years old, just turned six. So he's experiencing these games for the first time as well. Yeah. Um, and he had a very different experience. Now they do have 
little stools that you can sit on mm -hmm. for you know young kids, which is great because you can't see the screens for a lot of these games. But um, I was just I was kind of interested in the games that he would gravitate towards. Like he really seemed to enjoy the uh, ninja, the original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle beat 'em up, oh, cool. four player yeah. beat 'em yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and of course, he dragged us all in to play with him in the game. It's one of the last games we played, and so we were all exhausted and didn't like I couldn't really move my fingers. <laughs> and he's like, "No, no, you gotta keep playing." Um, of course, he had tons of energy, uh, but uh, you know, he he kind of moved towards like uh, he liked a lot of the shooter games too, which I found interesting, even if he couldn't play them very well. Like he got really into um, Tempest, uh, mm. which is a you know tube shooter, yeah, where you kind of you have like this uh, you know wheel again. If if this thing isn't working right, you can't play the game, and you kind of spin this wheel to kind of rotate around a tube. That's right, and then you shoot down at the um, you know little geometric shapes. Very geometric. Mm -hmm. It's not you know abstract i guess you could say um but it's a very fast-paced game but he got really into it and actually did all right we kind of played it together um i i controlled the spinner and he controlled the fire because he, he wanted to play yeah. he, thought, he, he thought every game was two player even though it wasn't oh, okay. which i thought was interesting <laughs> so he, he would always find a way to kind of get in but um yeah it was it was an interesting experience to kind of see these very old games from uh a younger gamer's eyes um he because i didn't really expect because he plays a lot of games on his um, tablet. Mm -hmm. So I didn't expect him to connect with as many of the games as he did. Um, but even getting into a game that had like, you know, joystick controls and button button presses, um, he was getting into it and figuring it out and working through it. There was like a, a, vers a versus Mar Super Mario Bros. cabinet there that he was playing through, and he had, he had been familiar with Mario as well. So he was trying to figure out how that game worked. And um, it's interesting. I don't, know, I don't know where arcades are going, um, so I, for me, it was just kind of an experience to see different people playing in an arcade, different experience, um, not just from what I'm used to, but from my, what I'm used to here in some of the arcades that we have in Dallas. Um, and also from the people that I normally go to arcades with, which are typically adults that are going to drink and play games. Mm -hmm. And this was a very different, this was, no, this was a family friendly, you're going to, you're just going to play the games. And so it was a kind of a different That's mentality. That, that sounds like a lot of fun. I I agree. I wish there was a place like that around here. Yeah. Um, it, you know, I, I still call for the new equipment to be created, to be produced, and for these old games to be put into new cabinets with with new hardware. Yeah. Um, I think that, that, would, that the time is now. Well, and to upgrade, you have to get in there and clean out and possibly replace of course. joysticks and the spinner balls and all these things. But if you're talking about original work, equipment, right? that's extremely hard to do and sometimes very expensive. Right, which is why you might have to replace those components yep. with newer ones. But, you know, with 3D printing and and this sorts of things, uh, sort of print-on-demand technologies where they are, it could well be that that's a lot easier now or could be a lot easier in the next 5, 10 years than it would have been 10 years ago. Yeah. And that's another reason why I say the time is now. Uh, but if we start thinking in terms of, don't, don't get me wrong, the, the retro cabinet, the classic retro cabinet, that is super, super awesome. But I, I think that there might be more of a place for that in the collector's home than, say, in a public space where that cabinet's not going to be respected. Um, and if we take the, you know, the, the, the software, which, of course, can be duplicated, and we put it into new hardware... And and then when the time comes to replace the say the joystick, you just you go in the back. You've got ten joysticks. You screw it in. You're good. Um, I think that that might be more the the, the right model for a, I, a free I, play type of place. I agree with you as long as you. There's a subtle difference between some of some of the buttons on different cabinets, even though they look the same and they're oh, the yes. same size. Some of them are concave. Some of them are convex. We agree. Little things like that. You have to. You have to respect the choices the designers for that game made the original yes i completely yes. agree with you completely like with uh, monkey ball if you oh, if that yeah. joystick is not a banana i'm not gonna play it <laughs> you know you're right <laughs> grab your salt shakers because it's time for some reckless speculation arcs used to engage with rumors hearsay and all sorts of crazy theories all right so uh, you may be familiar with a game called Pokemon Go. Yes, no. I'm familiar with it. Yes. Okay. So um, Niantic has, I don't want to say broken ties with Nintendo. That's not, that would not be accurate to say, uh, but they have, they've gone in a different direction for their next game and they've been working with the WB. 
um, that's Warner Brothers, right? Mm. Not, and, not Whataburger? Not Whataburger, no. <laughs> um, and what they have announced is Harry Potter, Wizards Unite. Ah, Harry Potter. Silencio. A launch date has not yet been announced, but Niantic Labs said more information will be released in 2018. It's supposed to be similar to Pokemon Go. The Harry Potter Wizards Unite mobile game will show digital images on top of real-life objects when you view them on a smartphone or tablet. That was November 9th uh, that that was released. That's pretty much all we know now. There have been some teases from the the, the creator um, and other things. Um, it so happens we know some folks who are actually working on the game, uh, but of course they are tight-lipped mm. and haven't told us a blasted thing, mm. um, which I completely respect. And um, what it really comes down to is this. We did some uh, some hopeful speculation, some reckless speculation, some various other things. And I think it was episode uh, 81 mm. when we talked about our augmented reality uh, sort of show. Um, and, and I think that this is has the potential to be that next level great experience that we were sort of hoping for in that. Uh, in fact, in my, in my end of year uh, last year, I think it was the end of year, uh, I said what I was really hoping for uh, to come up was that use of that technology. It's, it's sort of my, my holy grail uh, is, is augmented reality. So let's do some reckless speculation. Uh, first of all, I think that what's going to happen here is we're going to see less of the wizard duel type element mm. that might have been in the movies or, or whatever. Um, as a PVP type of thing and more of a, uh, there's bad stuff out in the world that we need to compete together to do. And so I think there's going to be a lot of, uh, oof, I don't really want to say this. It sounds bad. A Pokemon go reskin mm. feel to it. Yeah. And that's, I'm curious to see what they do with it because on the one hand it it's, it is and it, it does and it doesn't work, right? Because the whole idea behind Harry Potter is that actually they wizards and magical things exist in our world. We just don't know it. Yeah. Um, because they do a very good job of hiding themselves and of hiding the more magical elements. So as far as we muggles are concerned, um, the world is just what it is. Right? Uh, but our phone is going to be a magical it's kind sort of, the, of tablet, it's, if you will. Yeah, it's like the lens into this wizarding yes, world. So, which is brilliant. Uh, yeah, so it's an interesting idea. What, and they've kind of mentioned, too, that like in that initial announcement, they said, like, oh, yeah, you'll encounter characters from the wizarding world and all this uh -huh. different stuff, um, which raises the question to me, like, you know, in Pokemon, it makes sense because they're animals, essentially. Yeah, yeah. So it's just like, oh, yeah, we've got a lot of rats flying around and pigeons and other Pokemon. Uh -huh. um, there's only one Dumbledore. There's only one. Uh, but if you think in terms of, say, uh, the Magical Creatures movie mm -hmm. that came out not too long ago, a couple of years ago, I guess now. Um, there's a whole pantheon of uh, Potter. I'm going to go ahead and say Potter Moore, mm -hmm. referencing that sort of online experience mm -hmm. of Potter Moore uh, world. Mm -hmm. In other words, um, canon animals, fantasy animals, mm -hmm. that kind of a yeah, thing. Yeah, that's a good point, too. I think they mentioned the Fantastic Beasts. Yeah, the Fantastic Beasts, I think uh, there's even a book, mm -hmm. um, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, that, that was movie. out long before the movie. Mm -hmm. Long before the movie. Um, but the, uh, you know, the idea of going out and encountering magical creatures, I think is is pretty close to the Pokemon experience. Mm -hmm. What I'm most excited about is they have writers on staff. And so I think that what's probably going to happen is that there's going to be plot. Mm. Uh, some maybe It may be loose plot. It may be experience-driven. Um, and, and maybe uh, Hermione or somebody pops up and she's like, oh, hey, I need you to go collect this thing for me. Mm. I'm making a potion for potions class. Done. That I can see. I can see that working. Um, I'm hoping it doesn't turn into basically Pokemon where you're capturing creatures and fighting them or something yeah. like that. I could see maybe collecting. Um, what I'd really like to see, though, is like, you know, to that point, it's more quest driven. Mm -hmm. um, you are gathering magical items or finding things or encountering things in order to accomplish something. Yeah. It's not as like it's not um, uh, speaking of other Niantic properties. Um, it's not Ingress where right. it's Definitely all about not like, Ingress. the the territory control thing where everything revolves around that. Right. Um, it's not, uh, you know, collect and fight with Pokemon like Pokemon is. It's right. got to be something else. And and I think that's a really important point to make is if you, if you say how much of a difference there was between the Pokemon Go game and uh, uh, the original Ingress. Pretty significant. Huge. Yeah. But they use some of the same data structure. Mm -hmm. So if you have that same sort of element, we know where stuff is because – Google, yeah, right. Uh, we've got we've got Google powering this thing. We got the data, you know, from Google Earth. Um, what can we do with that? And the answer is anything you want. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I could also see there I think being that's exciting. 
I, I could also see there being kind of like a community, like in the same way that Pokemon Go kind of has this competitive element of like, you know, team red, blue, yellow. Oh, yeah. Um, I could see Four like houses getting sorted into houses. Ah, They've even yeah. got houses now for the uh, the American Wizarding School um, that's been in the expanded lore. Yeah, um, that's true. So in the same way that Pottermore has you go through a sorting hat quiz, I would even I could even see them tying it into your Pottermore account where sure. um, that's the, kind of like the account that manages all your data. And so whether you've been sorted before, or you're getting resorted or you're sorting with a new account or something like yeah. that. Um, I'm Slytherin, by the way. I proudly admit this. Huff, Hufflepuff for me. So. No, uh, totally. <laughs> you, are, you are so completely totes a Hufflepuff like my wife. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm interested to see what they do with it. Um, and to what extent, like... The, the MMO problem of everyone has the same experience, uh-huh. which becomes even less plausible. And now I guess like you can have in theory, like, you know, you're communicating through something. It's not like they're literally here with you. Oh, yeah. So, like, yeah, you, you know. just have a, a stone or a magical mm-hmm. something. And so they're that... speaking to you remotely wherever yeah, they are in the world. Um, but kind of like the, the, the main character, you know, from the story is interacting with every single player in the world. You kind of suspend your disbelief there. It's like, yeah. this is my journey. And, you know, we can just sort of assume that no one else is doing exactly the same thing, even though they are. Um, well, that's every video game everywhere. So. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like I said, the MMO problem. So. Right, right, right. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm interested to see what they do with it. And um, what the mechanic is going to be. Yes. Because uh, I could definitely see it being a kind of going back to that houses thing of like almost the, the competition of like in this period of time, perhaps, uh, which house has the most points for accomplishing tasks as opposed to it being a direct competition thing like Ingress is where it's all about um, controlling territory. That's correct. Well, okay. So it's reckless speculation. Uh, we've silenced Jim. <laughs> what, what is your reckless speculation for this game? Your most reckless of all. I think basically what I just said um, is that it's going to be kind of a a competition to complete tasks. Um, I I hope they don't do this, but I, I'm kind of expecting the thing of um, you're going to be walking around and encounter famous character uh, who maybe has traveled here. And hopefully it's more of like they're here temporarily sort of thing. So you get to interact with them. It's like, hey, I'm so and so and I'm here because I'm doing blah, blah, blah. Um, as opposed to it being like a thing of, um, I've encountered, you know, 20 double doors today, <laughs> that sort of thing. Right. <laughs> um, and, and whether they're like visiting specific locations or if they just populate in the world, I'm also curious to see to what extent it is like, here's the recognizable people we already know uh, versus uh, the more generic elements of Harry Potter, mm-hmm. which they could use this as an opportunity to expand upon. But I think they got to strike the right balance between having the sort of star power and um, having the stuff that's generic enough that doesn't feel forced yeah if that makes sense okay so here's the thing that most people don't think about with the harry potter universe Mm -hmm. meaning specifically harry potter as a character in his adventures Mm -hmm. right that story took place in the 90s Mm -hmm. um it 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 basically started in 92 and went through 90 i guess 98 99 um if we end up having a young hermione or a young neville or whatever that is going to be extremely anachronistic, mm-hmm. which is a little bit weird considering that we know the precise date mm-hmm. that Dumbledore did his duel mm-hmm. with he who shall right. not be named. A lot of us grew up literally with Harry Potter. And yeah. Things. Yeah. And, and it was, it was all kind of, uh, there was a bit of a retcon mm-hmm. with some of those things. Um, so I think my reckless speculation is this. I think they're going to mess that up. Mm. I think they're going to ask us to suspend disbelief on something because they don't want to add new canon mm-hmm. to what's currently happening in the year of 2017, and what I'd love 18, to see 19. Is them adding that new canon? Because that could also be the justification for whatever it is we're doing. Me too. If, for example, it's... Um, I think they're going to drop the ball on that, though. It, that's my reckless speculation. Yeah, yeah. I think that's where the game's going to fall apart. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so I, I kind of agree with you. I wouldn't be surprised at all if that happens. But I would love to see... Here is Harry Potter, the Harry Potter universe 10 years later, however long it is. Yeah. Um, Harry's an auror. Mm-hmm. He's an adult. Mm-hmm. We we could actually um, interact with his kids. Mm-hmm. I think yeah. that would be brilliant. And some of our missions are like maybe tracking down and fighting dark wizards and that sort of yes. thing. Um, there's some threat where like the wizarding world is going to sort of break out into the muggle world and we're trying to contain it or something like that. I think I that think would be, be wonderful. an interesting new chapter in the Harry Potter franchise. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So um, just kind of as, as a side note, as it happens, the the few people that we know who are working on it um, – we're, we're at one time locals mm-hmm. and uh, worked on various things. Uh, but one of the things that was worked on was Castleville. Mm. 
And uh, one of the writers for this game is also a writer on Castleville. And so I think that, that um, that's what I'm looking to for, for inspiration. Mm. And some of the most brilliant dialogue in that game came from that particular writer that I'm not going to name, uh, she who shall not be named. <laughs> uh, and so what it ends up um, being for me is I can kind of imagine and cast myself into what some of the dialogue might be like. Pithy one-liners that nail a character. Mm. I'm really expecting, this is my positive mm. reckless speculation, I'm expecting the dialogue in this to be top-notch, mm. uh, you know, we're talking absolute Warner Brother highest quality mm. product. I really think it's going to be. I think it's going to be fantastic. Cool. Uh, should we uh, unsilence Jim now? Yeah, let's do it. All right. <laughs> Obliviate. Oh, perfect. I feel like I feel like my memory of horrible events has been erased. Thank you. <laughs> this is the Mobile Minute, where we share something new or noteworthy about those computers we keep in our pants. So I talked a few episodes back about the um, the previews for Animal Crossing Pocket Camp, uh, and it is now out. It's available. Um, and it's interesting to me because uh, what I sort of predicted uh, or what I sort of anticipated based on the stuff that they were showing is that it's kind of a smaller take on essentially a full Animal Crossing experience. And as I've gotten into it, I found that there are certain features that I'm missing, which I won't go into right now. And it could be that some of them get added over time or maybe I just haven't discovered them yet. Um, but what's kind of stood out to me is it's a little bit of a different flow to the game. Um, the game is less about kind of having your personal objective and you can still have it to an extent. But the game now is a lot more focused on completing these requests for the different um, campers you're trying to attract to your campsite, um, building up the relationship with them. And then as you sort of do these things, you get rewarded with new materials that kind of keep go the cycle going of um, build up a friendship with someone, invite them to your camp. They'll usually request like, hey, I want these things to be in your campsite. Uh, and so you go and craft those things. And basically once you've done that, that's what invites them there. And essentially it's kind of like a the objective, if you want to call it that, is collecting these campers uh, at your campsite uh, and then continuing to uh, sort of build the relationship there. So um, overall, it's been it's been an interesting experience. I'm not super into it um, so far, but I've actually had a few sessions where um, I, I spent surprisingly longer than I, I thought I would because I've sort of got a bunch of material saved up and I'm going around and talking to people and completing tasks. Um, they do some nice things to kind of uh, speed up Animal Crossing a little bit. So, for example, when you go fishing, uh, fishing used to actually be a fairly difficult task in Animal Crossing. Now it's basically you just sort of throw the line at them, um, wait for them to bite, and then you just sort of tap and then you get them. Uh, whereas in, before, um, you know, fish would sometimes like nibble and then just go away, that sort of thing. So it felt a little bit more like real fishing. And I think that these are all sort of uh, steps they're taking because they realize that it's a mobile game. People are going to be spending less time with it. Um, and they just kind of want to get... Uh, get in and out in a way. So, uh, like I said, different points of emphasis, but still recognizably animal crossing. Um, and I'm definitely interested to see where they go with it from there. So I know, um, a good chunk of my friends have actually tried it out. We are friends with each other. Uh, they have a few things where like you can request help from friends to get into this area, but I think people are, um, disjointed enough, I should say in the, in the times they're playing it, that unless you're actually coordinating, it's, it hasn't panned out for me so far. Um, so I'm curious to see too, if they do more with the kind of like um, collaborative things in this game, the having more interaction with people. But um, yeah, I'd say that if you've ever been into Animal Crossing, give this a shot, see if you like it. Um, if you're new to Animal Crossing, this might be a decent way to get sort of introduced um, to certain elements, but I would still say that to get the true Animal Crossing experience, you've got to go with the um, console or handheld versions. Literally downloading it right now, Chris. Awesome. Yeah. And well Whenever uh, the AR Animal Crossing game comes out, I'm all over it. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. And now, this week's meaty topic of discussion. You recall at the beginning of this episode, we opened with this quote that kind of inspired this uh, topic for today uh, from Sydney Icarus. Listening to role playing game designers describe their process as like that how to draw an owl thing. Uh, first, find a motion you want to hit, then around that, just design an award winning RPG. And um, I can actually kind of relate to this in a way. I've listened uh, not as much as I, I used to because some of the podcasts I follow uh, have kind of had fewer episodes recently, but. Um, 
in the in the ones that I have heard, you'll they'll interview people, for example, who are coming out with this new Kickstarter game or um, who got some recognition for a game they came out with, and they talk about kind of say the genre they're trying to evoke with the game, mm-hmm. or they're talking about the emotion they're trying to hit with the game. And uh, I thought they had some pretty good stuff to say, especially you know having some experience as an RPG designer, kind of speaking very broadly about their process. I could sort of relate to it in my own way, but at the same time, I think whether or not this tweet meant to, what it kind of got me thinking about was like how specifically do you get from point A, this ideation of I want to evoke this emotion to point B, which is a game that actually succeeds in doing it, that. And is it is it so much an emotion or is it more of a this is this is the way that I want people to approach my game. This is how I want them to feel when they play and, my game. And I think that more broadly speaking, right. that's, that's it. Yeah, Because I know that, for example, um, I talked recently on a recent show about some of my experiences playing one of the uh, Powered by the Apocalypse, uh, mm-hmm. so a game in the Powered by the Apocalypse system, uh, Masks, mm-hmm. which is a, a very different um, experience because it's much more story-driven and more open mm-hmm. than um, – it's, it's more, almost like a collaborative storytelling ex- mm-hmm. experience to something like uh, Dungeons and Dragons, which I have a lot of experience playing as well. And that's much more uh, regimented, has a very set, defined um, amount of rules, mm-hmm. and – you have a lot more rolling. You, you're the purpose of this game is to, you know, basically, you're still you're still interacting, but you're you're getting loot. Mm-hmm. You're trying to level up. You're trying to make a character stronger and mm-hmm. better, so you can approach more challenges. Yeah. It's very different from like, okay, we're just trying to together tell the best story we can. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Um, and I think that specifically that tweet was we're talking about the emotions. It's uh, kind of been a lot of the more prominent indie games have come out recently have been sort of built around creating a particular feeling. But the way they do that is by having the gameplay evoke those feelings or generate those feelings during the play. Um, and so I do think, Jim, to your point that um, ultimately this conversation is about how do we have people play the game? And then while playing the game, what is the um, mechanical, the emotional, the story outcome of that? And how do we as designers... Um, make that happen yeah and when you're making a decision of what you're going for mm-hmm. um you know who's your audience who yeah. do you want to play this game and how do you make sure that that the audience and reading your your you know rpg book your instruction book you need to make sure that everything in that book is helping them understand this is the tone of this game this is how the game's going to fl- going to flow this game is not like dungeons and dragons or maybe it is mm-hmm. but they have to understand what it is uh and how what sort of mindset to be in when they're playing this game. Um, what's the GM's role? I mean, that's a huge factor in, in designing these games too. Um, is there a GM or is, is everyone together kind of a participant in the game? And if there is a GM, how much authority does the GM have? Are they just kind of um, following the rules, like kind of a rules, like making sure everybody's following the rules, rules lawyer kind of thing? Or are they driving the entire experience? You know, I think that's actually probably the most important question whenever designing an RPG is the role of the GM. Is the GM someone who has a vision of the world? Is the GM someone who has a vision of the characters? Is the GM someone who has a vision of the story? Mm -hmm. Any or all of these changes the outcome. And thats I know you can look at a a specific person and and their GMing style, and those things are going to be influenced by that. But I think if you don't understand the relationship between the GM or the DM <laughs> in in terms of the system, there are people who are a bad fit for certain systems. Definitely. They just are. Yeah. And um, if you've got somebody who um, they love the character interaction element, but they actually hate world building, giving them a, um, a module might work really well. Mm. Right. Because here's this character, they're generally going to react in this way to this sort of stuff that happens. Um, that sort of thing. And I think um, not to sidetrack us too much, I think it's related, Jim, when you talked about, uh, you know, Masks versus D&D and how those are two very <laughs> different games. I would say that without having played Masks, but I know it's uh, Powered by the Apocalypse, right? Yes. Um, so Powered by the Apocalypse games always have a very specific um, setting and therefore a very specific tone that they're kind of trying to evoke. Right. Uh, by the way, it's the, the, the types of characters that you can play as yes, and the powers and, they have. And in Masks, this one was specifically... Um, you are a young superhero team in mm-hmm. the vein of Teen Titans, right? So, or Young Justice. Mm-hmm. So, you're 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 playing um, a teenager, and you have these you're, these different roles that you have specifically in masks. The, the your character your character's role is not about 
the powers they have. Mm-hmm. It's not like a character class in D&D. Mm-hmm. It's about the role they have in the story, Agreed. which uh, is yeah. a very different mentality yeah, that's huge. from Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, and I was going to say the Dungeons and Dragons, one way you might describe it is actually more of like a dungeon crawling simulation game that sure, happens to have role playing sure. elements. Well, uh, and th- by that, I mean, like the ability to sort of interpret your character dramatically in different ways. But, uh, but I, the, I see what you mean. But on yeah. a, me- in a mechanical level, though, it's all about um, your ability to overcome certain obstacles. Well, on a mechanical and, level, it's a war game because yeah, that's exactly. what it started as. Exactly. I mean, it's yeah. it's that, uh, mechanically. Yes. Mm-hmm. So even though we call it role playing game, mm-hmm. the emphasis is not on playing a role mm-hmm. per se. It's about um it is about your character, but it's about the mechanics of what your character can do in a fight or in a dungeon or like how do you navigate through this your, dungeon space. One way to sort of interpret role playing in that way is your role is your role in the party. Sure. Uh, That's th- a good point. Or yeah. like, you know, if I'm if I'm in an army again coming from the war gaming right. aspect, cavalry has a very different role in a battle than infantry does. Artillery has a very mm-hmm. different role in the battle than cavalry and infantry. Yeah. Does. So you're looking at it from a mechanical standpoint mm-hmm. more so than a uh, character standpoint, whereas a game like Masks or any of the Powered by the Apocalypse games, much more about the character standpoint and then you look at some of the games that kind of straddle the line like um star wars um empire i forgot the name i'm sorry edge of the empire edge of the empire yes Um, star wars rebellion yes and destiny yes so the new star wars games Mm -hmm. uh, by fantasy flight um that those games are very much kind of a mixture like they have that's the storyline elements they have the you know the dice with the um you, you can succeed and you have an advantage. You can you can have a disadvantage. You can fail, but kind of have an advantage or you know ha- partial success, things mm-hmm. like that. So it allows for um, some storytelling elements to be involved, but it's still um, much more mechanical right. than a game like uh, like the Power by the Apocalypse. And honestly, I had a lot of time, particularly with my group, mm-hmm. running the Masks game. I mean, they they were open to trying it because they wanted to try new things. Um, and they were thinking they they've been thinking about developing a, a tabletop RPG once they're finished with their video game that they're releasing. Um, it's called uh, Pop Up Dungeon, by the way. Please check it out, <laughs> Google it. You know, look at their Kickstarter. They're they're getting close to actually releasing it. Uh, it's a very exciting game. Uh, the beta is actually coming out really soon, playable beta. Um, but that being said, um, and it is actually based off of tabletop RPGs, by the way, even though it is a video game. But it's much more based off of the dungeon crawling experience intentionally because mm-hmm. that's what it's meant to do right uh, but but yeah but I, they had a lot of trouble with the masks experience because it's a collaborative story and you have to, you're playing these roles in the story and that getting that buy-in for and maybe i picked the wrong setting too mm-hmm. picking the 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 mask setting where we're all teenagers and we're mm-hmm. you know mid-30s early 30s guys like for playing example in they might have had more success with um dungeon world correct because it's the aesthetic that they're familiar with from D&D. It's the kind of the overall sort of tone and what it is that you're doing, right. but it just happens to change the way that well, you're playing it. So we play this game, um, and I wanted to mention this a little bit. We play this game, and we, we've changed it, and we kind of make it our own each time, um, that we kind of just, we call DOS game, mm-hmm. and that is which... Just, is that German? Yeah, them just playing around with German, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's the game. But yeah, but basically it's... Um, the, the concept there is a very, very simple RPG um, with very with very simple stats, and that actually just changes all the time. Like, it's someone else's turn to play DOS game, <laughs> so they just make up their own rules. It's a very, very simplistic game. You still have stats, you have you have certain skills, but there, it's just basically, when it comes to the roll system, it's either a, you know, you have to roll over a certain number, and that's it. Mm-hmm. And it's, so it's like there's not a whole lot going on, so it's kind of a mixture of, it's, it's a little bit closer to that Star Wars Edge of the Empire style, where it's... Um, kind of role heavy but there's a lot of um narrative elements that go into it Mm -hmm. but so it's open but still not as open as like we're not trying to tell a collaborative story there's still a gm that's controlling the controlling the effect that creates the story that creates the rooms Mm -hmm. that creates the experience and creates the problems that the players must overcome Mm -hmm. like you're still not working together Mm -hmm. as you are in and I would say that's kind of apocalypse. that's probably the standard mode for role playing games, at least mainstream role playing games. Is ultimately it's going to come down to, um, however strictly or loosely you're running the story or basing right, right. on the scenario, it comes down to um, rolling when you're trying to determine whether or not a character can succeed at this action they're trying to take. And so you have the obstacle and you have the roll against the obstacle, mm-hmm. um, whether it's you know. Um, Opposed roles where you have both uh, the NPC and the PC rolling, or whether it's against a fixed obstacle number, that sort of so, thing. So let me ask you this, because um, I've played I've played several tabletop RPGs, but I know I know y'all have played 
Um, I, I think you all have played more than I have, uh, or at least more different ones than yeah. I have. Um, so I, in my experience with Dungeons & Dragons, um, I would consider someone a bad GM if they are antagonistic towards the players. As Absolutely. In, as in they are, even though they're supposed to be um, they build a story, they tell the story, they're in control of everything. They're not necessarily trying to make the players lose. That's just game design. Right? It's never but, us versus them. But my question is, are there tabletop RPGs where that is the design? Where the 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 GM's role specifically is, I, I am against the players. Well, I, Out of curiosity. The, the quick answer to that is there are plenty of board games that are that way. Mm -hmm. um, I would cite uh, Mansions of Madness, the before it went digital. Actually, it's interesting. A lot of them are going digital now with, mm. with apps to avoid this. But um, the, uh, you know, like Descent, um, the, the the Star Wars uh, Imperial Assault. I've actually played Descent, by the way. Yeah. It is like that. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Well, the thing is, there's now... But it's an, not a table. It's a, it's a board game. Like it's so. a board game. Yeah. And the thing is, there's now an, an app which allows you to not have a... a a GM, a monster master, or whatever. Oh, the, so the, the the app will actually control that, and now all the oh, players are collaborative. Every single one. It's interesting that because it really moving, changes the game. Yeah, we're moving away from it. Imperial Assault, the new one just came out. Mm. Uh, it's new scenarios. It's not for the old stuff. Uh, but anyway, the point is that I, I think that as soon as you do that, as soon as you create that antagonistic "I am me versus you" mentality, you've entered into board game land. I really, really think so, yeah. um, because you've shifted the core mechanic of, hey, we're all in this together. This world is out to eat you, but I'm the GM, and I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you what you need to let that happen. I may let that happen, um, but I'm gonna give give you what you need in order to overcome it. Right. You know what I'm saying? And I think that that's that's a shift. Um, it's, it's like, hey, you want to play my game? Oh, I'm going to try to kill you. Yeah. It just, yeah. It's going to be hard to get mine. You that. know what? We've played with GMs like that. And, 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 and sometimes you go but into But probably the not game. for very long. It's sometimes it's true. <laughs> yeah. The game might not last more than like one session. Yeah. And sometimes you go into those sorts of games knowing that like, hey, we're going to play a game where kind of the idea behind it is it's a meat grinder. And it's... Oh, but, and that's, but that's a little bit different yeah. though, yeah. right? Because they're not trying necessarily to kill you. Mm -hmm. It's just a really hard game. Yeah. Yeah. That's very true. Yeah. Or you might have kind of like the GM is going to effectively act like they're doing everything they possibly can to kill you, but in kind of like a, a balanced way, uh -huh. kind of to Doc's point, like there's kind of a way out. Um, even if it's extremely challenging and you know that like you're trying to like really ramp up the difficulty, it's still possible. It's not impossible. I also think another aspect of, um, without sidetracking us too much, is the um, antagonistic relationship to the players in terms of the story and in terms of like uh, what people would call railroading, that sort of thing. That's a good point to um, bring up because I've had that experience um, with – Dungeons and Dragons as well too. I mean, where just you know playing with some friends, if you're if you're not necessarily a good GM and you think, well, I've got this great story that I'm going to tell, you know, if your players want to kind of explore a different area, that should be okay. And maybe you don't have something prepared for them to go into tons of detail in that other space on that one session, but you certainly could in a later session. Well, yes and no, um, and and I think this well, is... well within reason. Obviously, yeah. I'm not saying you know, of course, but I mean, you you certainly don't want to have this is the story that I am going to tell. No matter what, you are you are participants in my story now, and you're just going to play the part of actors in the story that I am the director and I'm telling you. Okay, so there's that's two, different. There's so. two provisos to this. Yeah. Okay. I, I I agree with what you're saying, but there's two provisos. Proviso one: you've chosen the right system. Because here's the thing: D and D doesn't actually um, open itself up much to this i want to go uh off the map you know what sure, i'm saying sure. um, in other words it, it really works well within the structure right. of um the the scenario now don't don't get me wrong good gm dms good dms are going to be able to uh create a scenario that is robust enough that feels like it uh it has lots of options and, and so on mm -hmm. and so forth but you may have different ways to approach a quest, stuff yes, like that. But right. you are expected, it's a convention, that you are expected to, to, when you're in the tavern and you get the plot hook... Right, yes. ...to take it. Right, like whatever the main quest... Like the, the GM prepares, or the DM in this case, mm -hmm. prepares a certain um, quest for you. Like right. it's the main quest, quote-unquote. Right. And so you're expected to make that your... That is your main priority. There may be other things... you're playing. Right. There may okay. be other things you can do, but that's what's been prepared. And so, yes, there, there is that um, that little bit of buy-in you have to have. Otherwise, there's no game. Okay, so so that part I agree with. That's proviso yeah. one, uh, is that you've chosen the right system um, for the context of that. Proviso two is this. Um, the players have to be the right kind of players. 
you have to be on board with this. Your group has to be the right group. Some groups are just going to be jerks and, and they're full of jerks. And they're these guys who they're, they're in it uh, specifically to, to maim and kill and hurt. And uh, the, there's this innocent farmer who has uh, something I need. He's dead. And, <laughs> and, and literally it's, it's this different well, sort of escapism. And is in that situation too. I think that also depends on the game because if you're playing, say, an evil campaign in D and D, it might make sense to do that. I would consider sure. I would consider the jerk character the one that is like everyone is is intent on playing this sort of game, and the jerk's like, no, I'm going to do this instead. Yeah. And so you're going against what the rest of the group wants to do, and so you're basically you're kind of throwing a wrench in in, the, yeah, in both the GM story and, you, and, and the other players and you experience probably won't last long in that group. Sure. And that um, I think is the real issue. It's more it's it's not necessarily what you do, it's the context within within, you know, which you do it, right? Yes. Okay, so uh fun fun little aside. We talked about this a little bit in the past. Uh but there there is a book series called uh NPCs. Mm-hmm. And what's cool about NPCs, it's actually a, a trilogy. Um is that it takes this idea of the jerky player characters and then sets them aside and focuses on the NPCs and tells the story from their perspective. Mm. And but in the background you still see the PCs, these this this you know, uh, these guys I was just describing who want to just maim and kill for no reason. Um, they're in the background and they become sort of the non player character, the non-focused care. It's, it's really an interesting thing. Uh, it's by Drew Hayes and there's, there's three in the series, but, uh, NPCs highly recommend it. If you are a, um, sort of D and D like fan, you know what I'm saying? If you play Pathfinder, mm-hmm. if you play any of those types of things, if you're an RPG genre, yeah, I should fan. check that. Out. I, and I, I, I honestly am. I mean, I, I've, I know you are. I've, I've definitely learned that over the years. I've played a lot of different kinds of RPGs. Um, I like Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. I didn't like yeah. Fourth Edition, but I, I, I generally like the the games. I think Fifth Edition has been actually a breath of fresh air after Fourth, which mm-hmm. tried to go too far towards board so games. I'll out myself. I am actually not a D and D fan. Yeah. Um, as a genre. I mean, there's the fantasy genre, right? Mm-hmm. And then there's the, what I will call the the high fantasy D&D genre. Yeah. yeah. The dungeon and crawler genre. The dungeons, yeah, the dungeon crawler genre. That's a good way to say it. I don't actually like it. I know way more about it than someone who doesn't <laughs> like it should. I have a deep respect for it. And I totally understand why people play it. But whenever it really comes down to it, I would much rather tell a heavily narrative-driven story in uh, some other system in a post-apocalyptic wasteland or something like that. Pick one. doesn't matter. doesn't mm-hmm. matter what. I'd even, I'd even rather tell it in that fantasy genre uh, than, than to actually follow the rules and lore of specifically D&D or specifically Pathfinder. Um, and, and part of that has to do with my recognition that a lot of it is a pastiche. And don't get me wrong, it's a love letter, but it's a pastiche of Tolkien. Yep. And so because of that, if I'm going to do that, I'll just grab Burning Wheel and play Tolkien. You know what I'm saying? I'll grab a different system well, with, and, and actually play in Middle Earth. And you like, and I, I think you, you also don't necessarily like the system of the, the D&D system or the I have no real system. problems with it. Well, but Burning Wheel is, is very different from it's D&D. It's very different. It's significantly oh, different. And it's just a so preference. If, so if you're saying you'd rather do that, I mean, there are, you can find modifications for Dungeons and Dragons or Pathfinder mm-hmm. that make it much more similar in terms of lore or basically just directly the mm-hmm. same of actual Tolkien, like Lord of the Rings, stuff like oh, that. Yeah. So it's not that difficult to find, but you choose Burning Wheel instead. Why? Because you like that system more. And I think right? that brings us, yeah. so to sort of bring us a little bit more back to like, how do we achieve certain things in these games? Sure. Um, and a lot of it, like really all that we can control aside from like saying, here's the setting. And sometimes we have very specific settings. Sometimes we say, here's the sort of setting you're going for. Uh, sometimes like in a lot of games, the doc and I designed is setting agnostic. So it could really be any setting. Yeah, that's half the fun for us, actually, is is that world-building process. Mm-hmm. Whenever you subscribe to the world of D&D or even the, the, the world of Middle-earth, you, you're you like, okay, let me pause this and go check the wiki. You know what I'm saying? And that's what we try to avoid is those mm-hmm. moments where you you pause to, to go check the wiki. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and so what we game designers have the most control over is um, – is the mechanics, is the systems. And so I think that what you start asking yourself is, 
Uh, what systems do I want to have in my game in order to achieve the end I'm trying to achieve? Uh, so in D&D, like we, we've been talking about, the mechanics are all about um, here are the skills that my character has. Uh, maybe here's the equipment that I have, that sort of stuff, uh, how much damage the sword does, that sort of thing. It's all about um, your ability to fight monsters, get through dungeons, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the mechanics are built around that aspect of the game, and therefore that aspect of the game is going to be the central element of it. Um, Whereas if you have something that's more narrative driven, then maybe you loosen up on that. And you have systems that sort of enable it, um, but the systems are more about other things, um, or you put a different emphasis. Or say, for example, if your game needs to have magic, uh, if you want to have a very specific magic system, like magic in this world works this way, then you design a lot of rules around how magic works, or you say uh, magic works this way can kind of be whatever you want, just sort of wing it, that sort of thing. I, I think a, a one thing to look at, because we talked briefly about character roles and mm -hmm. roles in the party, and I think how you define those roles or how you choose not to define those roles, mm -hmm. I think that's that will really influence the game experience mm -hmm. and, and it the gives design, you it tells you right? kind of the direction the game's supposed to go sure. in. Sure. So so are you are you playing a game where it's um you need to you need to have these sort of stats and you need to play this sort of character in order to have access to mm -hmm magic mm -hmm. or this sort of magic or this sort of ability or is it something more like say the Fallout, you know, special system where anyone can kind of do anything? But you still, it's still stat-driven. Mm -hmm. So you still have to have a certain level of stat to use this weapon. You still have to have a certain level of skill if you want to be effective mm -hmm. at, say, shooting you know, a laser pistol. Mm -hmm. But anyone can be anything. You're not, a, um, you're not a ranger or a fighter or a wizard. You're just you know, a person in the, the post-apocalypse who has really high laser pistols, mm -hmm. laser blasting skills, right? And so the stats that you have, too, I think also and tie into those mechanics and tell you what it is that you can roll for. And kind of going back to our randomization sure. talk that we had a few episodes ago, um, asking yourself basically, and it's not always rolling, granted, but like we're just going to use rolling as the broad term for randomization, deciding what happens. What are you rolling for and why? Um, and so even in something like Dungeons and Dragons, there's the charisma stats, the, the presence of the charisma stat tells you that there are situations in which your charisma and your ability to talk to people is going to become important. Right. Um, if you have a game that doesn't have a charisma stat, if you choose to include it, it's because the players decide to include it. Uh, and so the game's going to steer you away naturally from mm -hmm. charisma because the stuff that the game is trying to direct you toward or, um, to kind of move a little bit into like feedback loops, mm -hmm. um, when I roll this stat and I'm successful, these things happen. When I'm unsuccessful, these things happen. And that affects the trajectory of the story. The way that you balance that, the types of stats you use when you roll, why you roll, et cetera, et cetera, all kind of point you toward here's the experience the players have and what it's going to encourage them or discourage them to do. There's also an element to that, which is my character might be better at something than I am as a player. And uh, maybe, maybe... Oh, I would hope so maybe, if you're playing an RPG. Well, yeah, but maybe I have no charisma. Speaking of the charisma sure. stack, mm -hmm. I, and so I'm the most boring person in the world, but I'm going to roll, and, and my super cool guy is going to do his thing, and wow, mm -hmm. he really impresses everyone with his very well, wonderful but story. Isn't, mm -hmm. isn't that also like, um, you know, hey... I don't know how to, you know, I'm not like a, I'm not a sword master, but my character right. is, As and well, I'm going to attack this, you know, exactly. goblin. But if a system doesn't have a charisma stat, sure. then what you're all going to do is either suspend the disbelief that I have more charisma than, <laughs> mm -hmm. or my character has more charisma than I do, or um, you're actually going to require the player to role play within the context of a real conversation, and and so on and so forth. Do you guys want to talk briefly about? Um the role with its system. I know we have uh, season four is getting close to release. Is that mm -hmm. the case? Uh, yes. Doc and I, uh, we've talked a little bit before about a system that we've been working on, the role with its system, which is going to be the proprietary system for our other show, Roll With It, where we do, um, we play RPGs and we try to tell stories. It's been on hiatus for a little while, <laughs> about a year. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> lot, lots of stuff in the, uh, the, the editing backlog there, but uh, we're catching up. And uh, we're actually getting very close to releasing the system, which uh, I'm very excited about. We're in the layout phase right now. We're putting the final touches on it. Uh, so it should be coming out very soon. And uh, Doc and I went into it knowing that our objective was, say, as opposed to D&D, &D, with it being the, um, the dungeon crawling simulator, our objective specifically was to tell stories and to do it in a way that encourages um, – all the players to get involved and to uh, have like sort of dramatic moments come up and to pace things a certain way. And so while we weren't planning to, 
do a specific tone, we had a specific objective in mind where we wanted to, again, do all those things we just said. Um, so we built in systems where each episode of gameplay, so that you can translate to episodes of a show, like our show does, mm -hmm. um, has a certain number of scenes. And you know that once you get through that certain number of scenes, the episode is over, you move on to the next one. Um, there's a certain number of episodes in a series. So you know that you're trying to tell a story that's going to end at a certain point. And even if you continue the story through additional seasons, um, it's not like the sort of infinite ongoing thing that you can have, have with D&D, &D, et cetera. We built in a mechanic where we have people, uh, we make sure people stay involved in the story and no one sort of steals the spotlight too much because you have a hand of cards with a limited hand size. Uh, and you have to play a card to either open or enter a scene. And you can only open the scene if you have the most cards left in your hand. So someone who hasn't been involved at all in the episode, after a few scenes, is going to have the most cards, and they get to open the next scene. Um, so we're kind of, everything we do in the system, uh, we do very intentionally. And I think this kind of, you know, to we're going to be focusing in on what we're doing with our game, but this applies to achieving a certain end in whatever game you're doing. You have to think about every single rule in the game and what it is that it's accomplishing. Um, you don't have rules just for the sake of having rules unless you know that in this experience, I need to be able to tell whether or not they open the door. Mm -hmm. Here's how we tell whether or not they open the door. Yeah. Um, and so we also have a mechanic where the characters um, don't really have skills and such per se. Uh, you can kind of make whatever character you want. And rather than saying, um, I want to open this door, here's my lockpicking skill. Is my lockpicking skill higher than the obstacle for this door? We say instead, in this scene, my character wants to open this door. They're going to approach it this way. And it's essentially more of a narrative question is, do I have more narrative influence right now than the GM does? Mm -hmm. If so, then uh, I get narrative control and I could say, I open the door and I do it in this way. Right. And I, and I know from playing, um, playing the system um, at a few different times and uh, sometimes I, early on when it was originally, you know, devised and then when it became a little bit more developed mm -hmm. um we in the industry call that pre-alpha yes yes <laughs> um it is it definitely is 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 at that collaborative storytelling um side of things mm -hmm. you know like but you still obviously the, the 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 gm still has a story that they're trying to tell mm -hmm. but the players are are influencing the flow of the story and yes. can can really change how that story is told mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we definitely, um, this system more so than some of the other ones we design, we do encourage the GM to kind of have the story that they want to tell, have a general sense of how they want things to go, but they still need to be open to the player's contributions. Right. Um, when a player opens a scene, they're kind of choosing, here's what I'm doing, and they're mm -hmm. essentially, they'll either state or they'll just have in the back of their head the why of what I'm doing. And when they open a scene, they're kind of, for a little while, taking the story in the direction they want to see. Um, and so the GM has to kind of be willing to, um, flex. And I think this is true for any RPG is that a GM, if they're trying to sell, tell a particular story, they'll flex enough to like let the players explore something and right. find a way to, um, without pulling them back in, um, draw them in. Yeah. If that makes sense. You're not grabbing and yanking. You're you find putting, a way to entice them. Yeah, you entice yeah. them. You lay, lay out some uh, some bait, if you will, so yeah. to speak. Yeah, the uh, worst thing you can do is to throw up walls. Mm -hmm. The best thing you can do is to, I love that phrase, mm -hmm. throw out some bait. Mm -hmm. And it's, in all these games, all the games that we're talking about, regardless of whether you know they're collaborative stories and they're much more open, or they're very heavily rules driven and you know GM's the, GM is law that kind of thing, mm -hmm. um, there always has to be that buy-in from the players. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to have I'm willing to participate in this sort of story and mm -hmm. this sort of quest. And if you if you don't have that. You're going to have a bad time. That's yeah. right. You have to trust your GM. Yeah. And in some cases, that means developing a relationship, both right. in-game and out-of-game with, mm -hmm. with the GM. But at the same time, you got to trust your players, too. And we've talked about trusting the yes. players <laughs> in many contexts <laughs> before, uh, you know, video games and, and otherwise. But I think, you know, I think that, that it's important to throw out there, uh, if you're going to be like a mystery, for example, not every game's a mystery, but if, if, if there's a mystery element to it... Um, you can't coddle, but you also can't uh, make it so ab abstract mm. that there's just no way to, to get it. You have to lay out the breadcrumbs, basically. Yeah, you do. And you have to make it possible for both the characters and also the players to sort of grasp the mystery, mm. if you will. There needs to be sort of a mechanical and also narrative way to, to get the clues. Mm -hmm. I think there has to be, in all of these games... Um, those moments where the player can feel, you know, empowered and mm -hmm. special. Right. Um, every player at some point. Otherwise, you know, why are you really playing? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Or, <laughs> it's kind of my experience. Or if, say, the feeling you're trying to um, evoke is, say, it's a horror game or something like that, this feeling of powerlessness, um, figuring out how, how in the mechanics you do that. And I think that ultimately the question comes down to um, choice and consequence, which is something yeah. we talk about all the time on this show, is what choices do you give the players? And when mm. they make those choices, how does the game answer back? How does the game react to the choices they make? And by sort of tweaking, if you will, the way that the game reacts to those choices, you can create this experience because the player is going to start to learn the system, so to speak, even if it doesn't come across that way. Right. They're going to start to learn um, in a game where they're not supposed to be the super heroic fighter who can take on dozens of people at once. Um, if you try to take on three people at a time and just get your butt beat, uh, they're going to mm-hmm. figure out, I need to be careful when I fight people. Sure. I need to. And, yeah. and what is it like? It, there's different standards for each game. Mm-hmm. Like what is, what is the hero moment for one game? Mm-hmm. You know, it might be, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to solo all these, you know, this Mm -hmm. army or something because I'm just that awesome. But in another game, your hero moment could be something that's seemingly very minor. Mm -hmm. Um, Like, you you know, you're, you rescue one person in this Mm -hmm. one moment and, and you, you know, pull them out from like, you know, like a a spike trap or something. And that's your hero Mm -hmm. moment. So, Mm -hmm. you know, it just depends on the game that you're playing. And again, the, the way you teach the player what that heroic moment is, what is a heroic moment is by having the game offer feedback to what they've done yes. before. Yes, sure. Well, in some systems, you're not meant to be a hero at all in in the classic sense. Um, I, right, yeah, I, mean, I, I meant... I knew it, I knew yeah, what you I was meant. abstract hero yeah, moment. I didn't mean that literally. And, and so, but but <laughs> what you, you're saying that made me yeah. think of this. There's a system, one of my favorite systems of all time, mm. um, and, it, and it's not just because it's 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 wonderfully uh, you know complex or anything like that. I just I love this one particular element of it, even though those other elements are clunky. And that system is Mean Streets. Mm. The Mean Streets mm. system is basically you roll two d six, and you're trying to get uh, I think it's like a what is it a four or better seven or better I don't even remember it's terrible. But the point is this: <laughs> it uses it uses a uh, because it uses two d six. It's actually engaging in a bell curve. Your average yeah. role is going to be a bell curve, which means you're going to perform average on an average basis. Yeah. If you do something truly epic, it's going to be rare. If you fail colossally, it's going to be rare. Whereas with a D20, you're, you're actually rolling on linear probability. And so what that means is you are just as likely to roll that one as you are to roll a six, a 13, or the 20. Mm. And it's always a one in twenty shot mm-hmm. with modifiers, right? Right. And so what I what I really enjoy about the idea of using the dice mechanically to inform, and, and, and in a diceless system, it's the same. You use the mechanics, whatever they are, to to sort of inform the type of narrative you want to tell. In the case of Mean Streets, it's noir, and noir is all about average people being placed in these sort of dangerous situations where a bullet stops the show. Yeah. And th- and that's the case with that game. It, uh, you know, we we played a whole campaign where guns were used but no f- no shots were fired because a bullet would have ended it. And then you would have been on trial for murder because you know, and and that's a very very different feeling whenever that's a gun I need to now obey this guy because when you put a gun in my face, I I do what you say. Then right, it's like the D and D world, like real life. Yeah, yeah, right. Well, as compared to the D and D world, where it's like, uh, okay, so I'm going to roll to disarm, yeah. and disembowel, mm-hmm. and uh, as a, I think you, you called them murder hobos. Yes, <laughs> as a murder hobo, move on to my next victim. Mm-hmm. Right, um, and I, and I think some of that. Or, um, or or take the bullet. Oh, I, I took uh, twelve damage, but I still have plenty of HP left. Right, so it's I'm fine. still coming. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so like max right. pain, I'm just going to take a pain, painkiller and move yeah. on. So I think those abstractions. And we've talked about abstractions before, mm-hmm. um, but I think those abstractions need to be hardwired and hard coded into the system that you are playing. So if you know if you you haven't played enough uh, of a rich variety of RPGs to to sort of get. <laughs> what that is at first glance, uh, I highly encourage digging into some of the indie RPGs because that's a great way, especially like the one page RPGs, the one sheets, that sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, definitely. It's a great way to just really get those mechanics. You do a one shot or you do a little three to four episode campaign and suddenly you, you're realizing 
what the difference between rolling four d6 is because your stat is a four mm-hmm. and rolling uh you know a d20 plus four at plus four mm-hmm. because your stat is a four completely different results mm-hmm. completely different effects um also you know what's the difference between a percentile die and rolling a d10 or you know it the list goes on right so i think that that's huge is to say that uh, the type of heroes that you're playing, whether you're the, the type of hero who can bleed out or the type of hero c- who can never fail, important, incredibly important. And, you know, we're kind of speaking in broad terms right now, you know, in future episodes, perhaps we come back and we look at specific games or specific genres to see, analyze how they achieve these things. As we do a lot of times when we're talking about video games, we talk about what they're going for, how they do it or don't do it. Um, and so, again, we've been speaking very broadly on this topic. It can definitely be explored a lot further. Yeah. Um, and, you know, listeners, if you have any questions about like, uh, you know, say this RPG you tried did a really great job of evoking this feeling, but you're not sure how, mm-hmm. uh, maybe let us know. We can take a look at it and see here's what we think they did to kind of get you to this point. Um, or maybe even sometimes maybe the game achieved a certain feeling in spite of itself. The GM was good or the setting was good. Right. Or even though the mechanics weren't really built for it. That's how I feel um, about Dungeons and Dragons, actually. <laughs> uh, even though the mechanics weren't built for a certain thing, maybe uh, the game was run such that it managed to do that. Yeah. I, I think Dungeons and Dragons is actually a great example of that in particular. And Doc, you are right about that because um it's a little less true now but i think it's it still holds true but especially back in say ad and d um there were house there's house rules you choose what rules you want to follow right. and rules you don't that's exactly and right. you sort of tailor the game to to your your players and so it's it's meant it's actually encouraged and meant to do that it's become that kind of game yeah um so i think that's that's also a really big part of the role-playing experience and you know, when you're designing this game, are you are you considering that? Are you thinking about, hey, these are the rules that I want for my system, and I'm going to put in as much rules as I can, and I expect people to follow these rules, or is it I'm going to give them all of these rules, and they can choose which ones they want to follow mm-hmm. and which ones mm-hmm. they don't? In the same way, you know, a lot of games like, say, D&D will have entire systems or subsystems for specific things, where if you don't have a character who takes advantage of those subsystems, you can totally ignore it. It's like, I mean, grappling from, <laughs> from like, you know, earlier editions, like, like, uh, third edition. Yeah. No one wants to follow the gra- the grappling rules, so nobody does. So they abstract it or they just don't grapple. Yeah, it's become eh, legendary in right. its humor. <laughs> gra- but hey, rules. but there are those people that, you know, you're going to grapple, we're playing the grappling rules, pull out the whole, you know, spreadsheet, yeah. and you know <laughs> everything's ready. And you know that can ready. be fun if everybody's on board with sure, it. Sure, maybe so. It really can. Um, you know, whenever, um, whenever I was teaching, I was honored to be asked to write a chapter for Dungeons and Dragons and Philosophy. And my chapter was called, you got your role play in my gameplay, D&D and the story versus game problem. And so uh, if you if you grab a copy of Dungeons and Dragons and Philosophy, which I think you can get in the bargain bin for like $2, um, <laughs> that, that high quality writing that it was, um, what, one of the things that I stress and make a point of is that, you know, D&D is not for everybody, but for those that love it, and want it to be what it is, the story element is going to come out. And I'm actually quoting a, a very well-known uh, DM, DM Samuel was his name. Um, and and I interviewed him for this because I wanted to get it from an authority. Mm. And what he said is, uh, there's, there's nothing stopping you from having a rich and dynamic narrative in a crunchy system. Yeah, definitely. And if you don't have that, that's because your group, your DM is choosing not to do that. Right. So if you want it to be a dungeon grinding simulator, it can be that. It doesn't force you to tell a story. Um, you know, Doc and Kruger's uh, roll with it system forces you to tell a story. Mm-hmm. Or, depending on how you play it, again, if you choose to focus on the mechanical aspect and not do a lot of storytelling, you're going to find that the game functions mechanically. It does. But you're going to... It's going to be very... Your scenes will also be five minutes long. Yeah, it's it's, very, it's going to be very light. It's going to maybe feel unsatisfying mm-hmm. because the game's not built to be a crunchy mechanical that's game. Right. It's a game that's about narrative that has some strategic elements through the that's mechanics. That's a good way to say it. Yeah. That's a really good way to say it. But I guess the point is simply this. Um, role-playing is always and has always been about telling new stories in a dynamically rich world that has lots of lore. Yeah. It's always been that. Now, whether or not you choose to make up your own lore or you choose to uh, pastiche the Lord of the Rings universe um, is irrelevant. 
you're still telling stories. And you, if you need those, let's say, overly complicated, and, and I don't mean it that way, but um, you know, very, very complicated rule books in order to do that so that you can know what all the rules of Rogue are, mm-hmm. uh, go for it. I think that that's phenomenal and some it's people, super crunchy and, and fun. And some I, people need the challenge to be introduced by the game because otherwise they would just say, I'm awesome. I do the thing and nothing stops me. And, right, and it becomes right. a very flat, and, boring story. And, and that would, is very boring. And actually. I would say instead of complicated, I would I would actually use the word um, detailed. Detailed, simulation Or, or yeah. possibly complex. Complex. Um, but I think um, complicated suggests – isn't necessarily true. I would say. Well, you know, and that's true because uh, people look at the games that, that we play all the time and they, they go, oh, I'm not smart enough to play that game. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, and I'm not smart enough to play piano, but I know I could. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's not, yeah, they're not, you can, even, even D&D, if you, were fo- if you were playing with all the rules, except for grappling rules back in the day, mm-hmm. but <laughs> if, if you're playing with all the rules, even though I know a lot of people don't, you tend to house rule everything, I know I do it too. Um, it's still not even that. It's not that no, complicated. It's not. Have so, you ever read a book? Yeah. Have you ever watched a movie? Right. Uh, you know, I mean, come on. There's the, a learning curve. There's a learning absolutely. curve in everything. Absolutely. But you right? know what? There was a learning curve when you first read books too. You sure. started out with, a, you know, see Dick Run and you moved up to Lord of the Rings. You know, you started out with, uh, I don't know, Finding Nemo and you worked your way up to... Lord of the Rings. Wait, everything leads to Lord of the Rings. <laughs> everything leads to Lord of the Rings. Whoa. <laughs> say, I would say uh, Seven Samurai. There you go. <laughs> you know, you started out with uh, D and D, and you worked your way up to uh, Lord of the Rings <laughs> in, in Burning Wheel. But I, my my point is simply um, that if you find RPG mechanics to be too complicated or too daunting, as I did whenever I started, uh, there are so many systems out there which will get you into that world and just build, build on that vocabulary. I think the, I think the more important part, I know we're, we're coming up on time, but I do think it's important to remember um, when, when you're picking, you know, a system to play, really the more important part is what group are you playing with? Yes. And if you have a good group, even if it's system that you don't necessarily know that much about, yes. or even if you don't really like the system, if you know the people that you're playing with and you know that the GM is good at what what he or she does, you're going to have a good time. So, you know, give it a chance, even if it's a different system than you're used to, or even if it's, it, if it is a crunchier system, if you know that, that the, the people that you're playing with are... Um, you know, you're familiar with them and you know that, that, that they're invested in the game. That's incredibly wise. Very, very good point. Cool. Well, thank everyone for joining us for episode 117 of the backward-compatible.com podcast, our discussion on achieving a particular results in tabletop role-playing games. Um, and as always, we like to remind you that we are uh, trying to grow the show. So anything you can do to help with that would be very much appreciated. Share us with your friends. Uh, give us good reviews on iTunes to help with the searchability. Um, and definitely get involved right into us about anything you're interested in. Like we suggested earlier, uh, if you have a particular game, it's like, how did they do this in this game? Um, maybe pose the question to us and we'll take a shot at answering that for you. So um, we definitely want to hear more from the audience and uh, have a conversation back and forth because dialogue makes everybody better. <laughs> Anyway, I'm Chris. I'm Jim. I'm Doc. And we'll see you next time. We want you to write into the show because dialogue makes everyone better. If you want to comment on this episode, ask a question, share some info, voice an opinion, or request a topic, send an email to inbox at backward-compatible.com and we may feature you on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Backward compatible.